It is the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. Mm. And this morning, we talk about the existence of evil in the world and question why life is the way it is. And if ever there was anybody who had a reason to complain, it was a man named Job, <laughs> who lost everything he had, property, home, family, all God. And so his friends came to comfort him. And at first, the friends did a wonderful job. They simply sat in silence with him and shared his pain. Good lesson for us. But then they blew it. Because in Jewish teachings at that time, God blesses you if you're good, and he curses you if you're not. It's almost like a divine Santa Claus. He knows if you've been naughty or nice. And so the friends confront Job and say, all right, you've obviously been cursed. What did you do? Confess it and ask for forgiveness so that God might restore you. And Job says, I didn't do anything wrong. And the friends say, well, of course you did. Look what happened to you. This has to be a result of your sin. Confess it and say you're sorry so that God can forgive you. And Job continues to maintain that he did nothing wrong. And in our lesson for this morning, Job actually protests to God and demands an answer and wants to know what it was he did. He wants to be vindicated because he believes he didn't do anything wrong. This is the book of Job, chapter 19, beginning at verse 23. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book, so that with an iron pen and with lead they were engraved upon a rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I will see God whom I shall see by my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. In our psalm for this morning, it's almost as if Job himself had written the psalm. The psalmist makes a plea for vindication and protection. We're not sure what the psalmist did if the psalmist did anything at all. But apparently there has been an allegation, a charge, that the author of the psalm did something violent. And he's asking for God to announce his innocence. Please turn to page 221 in the front of the hymnals. We're going to read the first nine verses of Psalm 17. And let's read them antiphonally. I'll read up to the asterisk, the first half of each verse. You read the second half. Page 221, Psalm 17, verses 1 through 9. Hear my prayer of innocence, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Listen, Listen to my prayer, prayer which, which does not come from lying lips. lips. Let my vindication come forth from your presence. Let your eyes be fixed on justice. Weigh my heart. Summon me by night. Melt me down. You will find no impurity in me. I give no offense with my mouth, as others do. I have heeded the words of your lips. My footsteps hold fast to the ways of your law. In your path, my feet shall not stumble. I will call upon you, O God, for you will answer me. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Show me your marvelous loving kindness. O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who rise up against you. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who assault me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. Paul established a church in the Greek city of Thessalonica. 
And as was common in the early church, the focus was on something called the parousia. Fancy church word, worth 50 cents. And it refers to the second coming of Jesus. In fact, there were those who believed that Jesus had already returned. And they were, in fact, living in the last days. But there were others who were still waiting. When Paul wrote his first letter to the Thessalonians, he told them to be prepared because the coming was going to be any day now. But then any day turned into any week, and any week into any month, and any month into any year. And so Paul had to write back and correct any misunderstandings that the people might have had. Our New Testament lesson is from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, verses from chapter 2. St. Paul writes, As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit, or by word, or by letter as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was with you? But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose he called you through our proclamation of the good news, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, Comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Here ends our New Testament lesson. In the Old Testament, there was no concept of heaven or hell, but rather the Jews believed in a place called Sheol. And it's a concept similar to many religions of that time, a land of the dead. And this is where you would go after you died. We had this a couple of weeks ago when our lesson was about the rich man and Lazarus. It made a reference to Hades, which was the Greek term for Sheol. So here we have a developing concept that there is a life after death. And that was taught by the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' time. But there was also another party, another group, within the religious leadership called the Sadducees. And they did not believe in a resurrection of the dead. They did not believe in a life after death. But like the Pharisees, they also opposed Jesus because Jesus upset the status quo. Jesus put the needs of the people over the needs of religion. And so they set a trap for him. And quoting the book of Exodus, they came to Jesus with a riddle about a man who died and didn't have any children, no heir. And according to the Hebrew law, his wife, his widow, was required to marry his brother so that the brother could produce an heir for his brother. In the Sadducees' riddle, there are seven brothers. Hmm. And Jesus sees through what they're trying to do and puts them in their place. But in so doing, he also points out something that might be a little troubling for you. He indicates that in heaven, there is no marriage. There are no husbands and wives. 
because we are all one with God. Let's rise to the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel according to Luke, the 20th chapter, beginning of the 27th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, For those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Instead, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is a God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Ladies